You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. We're knee deep in Arthur Mackin's The Three Imposters at the moment, folks, so we thought we'd put together another shorter collection for you this week. Consider this a reminder of just how unnerving Guy de Maupassant's lesser known tales can be. We hope you enjoy them, folks. The Diary of a Madman He was dead, the head of a high tribunal, the upright magistrate whose irreproachable life was a proverb in all the courts of France. Advocates, young counsellors, judges, had greeted him at sight of his large, thin, pale face lighted up by two sparkling, deep-set eyes, bowing low in token of respect. He had passed his life in pursuing crime and in protecting the weak. Swindlers and murderers had no more redoubtable enemy, for he seemed to read the most secret thoughts of their minds. He was dead, now, at the age of eighty-two, honoured by the homage— and followed by the regrets of a whole people. Soldiers in red trousers had escorted him to the tomb, and men in white cravats had spoken words and shed tears that seemed to be sincere beside his grave. But here is the strange paper found by the dismayed notary in the desk where he had kept the records of great criminals. It was entitled, Why? 20th of June, 1851 I have just left court. I have condemned Blondel to death. Now, why did this man kill his five children? Frequently one meets with people to whom the destruction of life is a pleasure. Yes, yes, it should be a pleasure, the greatest of all, perhaps. For is not killing the next thing to creating, to make and to destroy? These two words contain the history of the universe, all the history of worlds— all that is, all. Why is it not intoxicating to kill? 25th of June. To think that a being is there who lives, who walks, who runs. A being? What is a being? That animated thing that bears in it the principle of motion, and a will ruling that motion. It is attached to nothing, this thing. Its feet do not belong to the ground. It is a grain of life that moves on the earth, and this grain of life, coming I know not whence, one can destroy at one's will. Then nothing, nothing more. It perishes. It is finished. 26th of June. Why, then, is it a crime to kill? Yes, why? On the contrary, it is the law of nature. The mission of every being is to kill. He kills to live, and he kills to kill. The beast kills without ceasing, all day, every instant of his existence. Man kills without ceasing, to nourish himself. But since he needs, besides, to kill for pleasure, he has invented hunting. The child kills the insects he finds, the little birds, all the little animals that come in his way but this does not suffice for the irresistible need to massacre that is in us. It is not enough to kill beasts. We must kill man, too. Long ago, this need was satisfied by human sacrifices. Now the requirements of social life have made murder a crime. We condemn and punish the assassin, but as we cannot live without yielding to this natural and imperious instinct of death, we relieve ourselves from time to time by wars. Then a whole nation slaughters another nation. It is a feast of blood, a feast that maddens armies and that intoxicates civilians, women and children, who read by lamplight at night the feverish story of massacre. One might suppose that those destined to accomplish these butcheries of men would be despised, no, they are loaded with honours. 
They are clad in gold and in resplendent garments. They wear plumes on their heads and ornaments on their breasts, and they are given crosses, rewards, titles of every kind. They are proud, respected, loved by women, cheered by the crowd, solely because their mission is to shed human blood. They drag through the streets their instruments of death, that the passer-by, clad in black, looks on with envy. For to kill is the great law set by nature in the heart of existence. There is nothing more beautiful and honourable than killing. 30th of June To kill is the law, because nature loves eternal youth. She seems to cry in all her unconscious acts, Quick, quick, quick! The more she destroys, the more she renews herself. 2nd of July A human being. What is a human being? Through thought, it is a reflection of all that is. Through memory and science, it is an abridged edition of the universe, whose history it represents, a mirror of things and of nations. Each human being becomes a microcosm in the macrocosm. 3rd of July. It must be a pleasure, unique and full of zest, to kill, to have there before one the living, thinking being, to make therein a little hole, nothing but a little hole, to see that red thing flow which is the blood, which makes life, and to have before one only a heap of limp flesh, cold, inert, void of thought. 5th of August. I, who have passed my life in judging, condemning, killing by the spoken word, killing by the guillotine those who had killed by the knife, I, I, if I should do as all the assassins have done whom I have smitten, I, I, who would know it? 10th of August. Who would ever know? Who would ever suspect me? Me, me? especially if I should choose a being I had no interest in doing away with. 15th of August. The temptation has come to me. It pervades my whole being. My hands tremble with the desire to kill. 22nd of August. I could resist no longer. I killed a little creature as an experiment. For a beginning. Jean, my servant had a goldfinch in a cage hung in the office window. I sent him on an errand, and I took the little bird in my hand, in my hand where I felt its heart beat. It was warm. I went up to my room. From time to time I squeezed it tighter. Its heart beat faster. This was atrocious and delicious. I was near choking it, but I could not see the blood. Then I took scissors, short nail scissors, and I cut its throat with three slits, quite gently. It opened its bill. It struggled to escape me, but I held it. Oh, <laughs> I held it. I could have held a mad dog, and I saw the blood trickle. And then I did as assassins do, real ones. I washed the scissors. I washed my hands. I sprinkled water and took the body, the corpse, to the garden to hide it. I buried it under a strawberry plant. It will never be found. Every day I shall eat a strawberry from that plant. How one can enjoy life when one knows how! <laughs> My servant cried. He thought his bird flown. How could he suspect me? Ha <laughs> ha! 25th of August. I must kill a man. I must. 30th of August. It is done. But what a little thing. I had gone for a walk in the forest of Vern. I was thinking of nothing, literally nothing. A child was in the road, a little child eating a slice of bread and butter. He stops to see me pass and says, Good day, Mr. President. And the thought enters my head, Shall I? Kill him? I answer, You are alone, my boy? Yes, sir. All alone in the wood? Yes, sir. 
The wish to kill him intoxicated me like wine. I approached him quite softly, persuaded that he was going to run away, and suddenly I seized him by the throat. He looked at me with terror in his eyes. Such eyes! He held my wrist in his little hands, and his body writhed like a feather over the fire. Then he moved no more. I threw the body in the ditch, and some weeds on top of it. I returned home, and dined well. What a little thing it was! In the evening I was very gay, light, rejuvenated. I passed the evening at the prefects. They found me witty, but I have not seen blood. I am tranquil. 31st of August The body has been discovered. They are hunting for the assassin. <laughs> 1st of September Two tramps have been arrested. Proofs are lacking. 2nd of September The parents have been to see me. <laughs> They wept. <laughs> Sixth of October. Nothing has been discovered. Some strolling vagabond must have done the deed. <laughs> if I had seen the blood flow, it seems to me I should be tranquil now. The desire to kill is in my blood. It is like the passion of youth at twenty. Twentieth of October. Yet another. I was walking by the river after breakfast, and I saw, under a willow, a fisherman asleep. It was noon. A spade was standing in a potato field nearby, as if expressly for me. I took it. I returned. I raised it like a club, and with one blow of the edge I cleft the fisherman's head. Oh, he bled, this one! rose-coloured blood. It flowed into the water, oh, quite gently, and I went away with a grave step. If I had been seen, <laughs> I should have made an excellent assassin. 25th of October. The affair of the fisherman makes a great stir. His nephew, who fished with him, is charged with the murder. 26th of October. The examining magistrate affirms that the nephew is guilty. <laughs> Everybody in town believes it. <laughs> 27th of October. The nephew makes a very poor witness. He had gone to the village to buy bread and cheese, he declared. He swore that his uncle had been killed in his absence. Who would believe him? 28th of October. The nephew has all but confessed. They have badgered him so. Ha, <laughs> ha, justice! 15th of November. There are overwhelming proofs against the nephew, who was his uncle's heir. I shall preside at the sessions. 25th of January. To death, to death, to death! I have had him condemned to death! Ha, <laughs> ha! The Advocate General spoke like an angel. Oh, yet another. I shall go to see him executed. 10th of March. It is done. They guillotined him this morning. He died very well, very well. That gave me pleasure. How fine it is to see a man's head cut off. Now I shall wait. I can wait. It would take... Such a little thing to let myself be caught. The manuscript contained yet other pages, but without relating any new crime. Alienist physicians to whom the awful story has been submitted declare that there are in the world many undiscovered madmen, as adroit and as much to be feared as this monstrous lunatic. A ghost. We were speaking of sequestration, alluding to a recent lawsuit. It was at the close of a friendly evening in a very old mansion in the Rue de Grenelle, and each of the guests had a story to tell, which assured us was true. 
Then the old Marquis de la Tour Samuel, eighty-two years of age, rose and came forward to lean on the mantelpiece. He told the following story in his slightly quavering voice. I also have witnessed a strange thing, so strange that it has been the nightmare of my life. It happened fifty-six years ago, and yet there is not a month when I do not see it again in my dreams. From that day I have borne a mark, a, a stamp of fear. Do you understand? Yes, for ten minutes I was a prey to terror, in such a way that ever since a constant dread has remained in my soul. Unexpected sounds chill me to the heart. Objects which I can ill distinguish in the evening shadows make me long to flee. I am afraid at night. Now, I would not have owned such a thing before reaching my present age, but now I may tell everything. One may fear imaginary dangers at eighty-two years old, but before actual danger I have never turned back, Maidam. That affair so upset my mind, filled me with such a deep mysterious unrest that I never could tell it. I kept it in that inmost part, that corner where we conceal our sad, our shameful secrets, all the weaknesses of our life which cannot be confessed. I will tell you that, strange happening just as it took place, with no attempt to explain it. Unless I went mad for one short hour, it must be explainable, though. Yet I was not mad, and I will prove it to you. Imagine what you will. Here are the simple facts. It was in 1827, in July. I was quartered with my regiment in Rouen. One day, as I was strolling on the quay, I came across a man I believed I recognized, though I could not place him with certainty. I instinctively went more slowly, ready to pause. The stranger saw my impulse, looked at me, and fell into my arms. It was a friend of my younger days, of whom I had been very fond. He seemed to have become half a century older in the five years since I had seen him. His hair was white, and he stooped in his walk, as if he were exhausted. He understood my amazement, and told me the story of his life. A terrible event had broken him down. He had fallen madly in love with a young girl, and married her in a kind of dreamlike ecstasy. After a year of unalloyed bliss and unexhausted passion, she had died suddenly of heart disease, no doubt killed by love itself. He had left the country on the very day of her funeral, and had come to live in his hotel at Rouen. He remained there, solitary and desperate, grief slowly mining him, so wretched that he constantly thought of suicide. "'As I thus came across you again,' he said, I shall ask a great favour of you. I want you to go to my chateau and get some papers I urgently need. They are in the writing-desk of my room, of our room. I cannot send a servant or a lawyer, as the errand must be kept private. I want absolute silence. I shall give you the key of the room, which I locked carefully myself before leaving, and the key to the writing-desk. I shall also give you a note for the gardener, who will let you in. Come to breakfast with me to-morrow, and we'll talk the matter over. I promised to render him that slight service. It would mean but a pleasant excursion for me, his home not being more than twenty-five miles from Rouen. I could go there in an hour on horseback. At ten o'clock the next day I was with him. We breakfasted alone together, yet he did not utter more than twenty words. He asked me to excuse him— the thought that I was going to visit the room where his happiness lay shattered upset him, he said. Indeed, he seemed perturbed, worried, as if some mysterious struggle were taking place in his soul. At last he explained exactly what I was to do. It was very simple. I was to take two packages of letters and some papers, locked in the first drawer at the right of the desk of which I had the key. He added, I need not ask you not to glance at them. I was almost hurt by his words, and told him so, rather sharply. He stammered, "'Forgive me. I suffer so much.' And tears came to his eyes. 
I left about one o'clock to accomplish my errand. The day was radiant, and I rushed through the meadows, listening to the song of the larks, and the rhythmical beat of my sword on my riding boots. Then I entered the forest, and I set my horse to walking. Branches of the trees softly caressed my face, and now and then I would catch a leaf between my teeth and bite it with avidity, full of the joy of life, such as fills you without reason, with a tumultuous happiness almost indefinable, a kind of magical strength. As I neared the house, I took out the letter for the gardener, and noted with surprise that it was sealed. I was so amazed and so annoyed that I almost turned back without fulfilling my mission. Then I thought that I should thus display oversensitiveness and bad taste. My friend might have sealed it unconsciously, worried as he was. The manor looked as though it had been deserted the last twenty years. The gate, wide open and rotten, held one wondered how. Grass filled the paths. You could not tell the flower-beds from the lawn. At the noise I made, kicking a shutter, an old man came out from a side door, and was apparently amazed to see me there. I dismounted from my horse, and gave him the letter. He read it once or twice, turned it over, looked at me with suspicion, and asked, "'Well, what do you want?' I answered sharply. "'You must know it, as you have read your master's orders. I want to get in the house.' He appeared overwhelmed. He said, "'So, you are going in—in his room?' I was getting impatient. "'Parbleu! Do you intend to question me by chance?' He stammered. "'No, monsieur, only it has not been opened since—since the death. If you will wait five minutes, I will go in to see whether—' I interrupted angrily. "'See here! Are you joking? You can't go in that room, as I have the key!' He no longer knew what to say. "'Then, monsieur, I will show you the way. Show me the stairs, and leave me alone. I can find it without your help. But still, monsieur, then I lost my temper. Now be quiet, else you'll be sorry.' I roughly pushed him aside, and went into the house. I first went through the kitchen, then— crossed two small rooms occupied by the man and his wife. From there I stepped into a large hall. I went up the stairs, and I recognized the door my friend had described to me. I opened it with ease, and went in. The room was so dark that at first I could not distinguish anything. I paused, arrested by that mouldy and stale odor peculiar to deserted and condemned rooms, of dead rooms. Then, gradually, my eyes grew accustomed to the gloom, and I saw rather clearly a great room in disorder, a bed without sheets having still its mattresses and pillows, one of which bore the deep print of an elbow or a head, as if someone had just been resting on it. The chairs seemed all in confusion. I noticed that a door, probably that of a closet, had remained ajar. I first went to the window and opened it to get some light but the hinges of the outside shutters were so rusted that I could not loosen them. I even tried to break them with my sword, but did not succeed. As those fruitless attempts irritated me, and as my eyes were by now adjusted to the dim light, I gave up hope of getting more light and went toward the writing-desk. I sat down in an armchair, folded back the top, and opened the drawer. It was full to the edge. I needed but three packages— which I knew how to distinguish, and I started looking for them. I was straining my eyes to decipher the inscriptions, when I thought I heard, or rather felt, a rustle behind me. I took no notice, thinking a draught had lifted some curtain. But a minute later, another movement, almost indistinct, sent a disagreeable little shiver over my skin. It was so ridiculous to be moved thus, even so slightly, that I would not turn round, being ashamed. I had just discovered the second package I needed, and was on the point of reaching for the third, when a great and sorrowful sigh, close to my shoulder, made me give a mad leap two yards away. In my spring I had turned round, my hand on the hilt of my sword, and surely, had I not felt that, I should have fled like a coward." A tall woman, dressed in white, 
was facing me, standing behind the chair in which I had sat a second before. Such a shudder ran through me that I almost fell back. Oh, no one who has not felt them can understand those gruesome and ridiculous terrors. The soul melts, your heart seems to stop, your whole body becomes limp as a sponge, and your innermost parts seem collapsing. I do not believe in ghosts, and yet I broke down before the hideous fear of the dead, and I suffered, oh, I suffered more in a few minutes, in the irresistible anguish of supernatural dread, than I have suffered in all the rest of my life. If she had not spoken, I might have died. But she did speak. She spoke in a soft and plaintive voice which set my nerves vibrating. I could not say that I regained my self-control. No, I was past knowing what I did. But the kind of pride I have in me, as well as a military pride, helped me to maintain, almost in spite of myself, an honourable countenance. I was making a pose, a pose for myself and for her, for her, whatever she was, woman or phantom. I realised this later, for at the time of the apparition, I could think of nothing. I was afraid. She said, "'Oh, you can be of great help to me, monsieur.' I tried to answer— but I was unable to utter one word. A vague sound came from my throat. She continued, "'Will you? You can save me, cure me. I suffer terribly. I always suffer. I suffer, oh, I suffer.' And she sat down gently in my chair. She looked at me. "'Will you?' I nodded my head, being still paralysed. Then she handed me a woman's comb of tortoiseshell, and murmured, Comb my hair, oh, comb my hair, that will cure me. Look at my head, how I suffer, and my hair, how it hurts. Her loose hair, very long, very black, it seemed to me, hung over the back of the chair, touching the floor. Why did I do it? Why did I, shivering, accept that comb, and why did I take between my hands her long hair, which left on my skin a ghastly impression of cold, as if I had handled serpents. I do not know. That feeling still clings about my fingers, and I shiver when I recall it. I combed her. I handled, I know not how, that hair of ice. I bound and unbound it. I plaited it, as one plaits a horse's mane. She sighed, bent her head, seemed happy. Suddenly she said, Thank you, tore the comb from my hands, and fled through the door which I had noticed was half opened. Left alone, I had for a few seconds the hazy feeling one feels in waking up from a nightmare. Then I recovered myself. I ran to the window, and broke the shutters by my furious assault. A stream of light poured in. I rushed to the door through which that being had gone. I found it locked and immovable. Then a fever of flight seized on me, a panic— the true panic of battle. I quickly grasped the three packages of letters from the open desk. I crossed the room running. I took the steps of the stairway, four at a time. I found myself outside. I, I don't know how. And seeing my horse close by, I mounted in one leap and left at a full gallop. I didn't stop till I reached Rouen and drew up in front of my house. Having thrown the reins to my orderly, I flew to my room and locked myself in to think. Then for an hour I asked myself whether I had not been the victim of an hallucination. Certainly, I must have had one of those nervous shocks, one of those brain disorders such as give rise to miracles, to which the supernatural owes its strength. And I had almost concluded that it was a vision, an illusion of my senses, when I came near to the window. My eyes by chance looked down, my tunic was covered with hairs, long woman's hairs which had entangled themselves around the buttons. I took them off one by one and threw them out of the window with trembling fingers. I then called my orderly. I felt too perturbed, too moved to go and see my friend on that day. Besides, I needed to think over what I should tell him. I had his letters delivered to him. 
He gave a receipt to the soldier. He inquired after me, and was told that I was not well. I had had a sunstroke or something. He seemed distressed. I went to see him the next day, early in the morning, bent on telling him the truth. He had gone out the evening before, and had not come back. I returned the same day, but he had not been seen. I waited a week. He did not come back. I notified the police. They searched for him everywhere, but no one could find any trace of his passing, or of his retreat. A careful search was made in the deserted manor. No suspicious clue was discovered. There was no sign that a woman had been concealed there. The inquest gave no result, and so the search went no further. And in fifty-six years I have learned nothing more. I never found out the truth. THE TERROR You say you cannot possibly understand it, and I believe you. You think I am losing my mind? Perhaps I am, but for other reasons than those you imagine, my dear friend. Yes, I am going to be married, and will tell you what has led me to take that step. I may add that I know very little of the girl who is going to become my wife tomorrow. I have only seen her four or five times. I know that there is nothing unpleasing about her, and that is enough for my purpose. She is small, fair, and stout, so, of course, the day after tomorrow I shall ardently wish for a tall, dark, thin woman. She is not rich, and belongs to the middle classes. She is a girl such as you may find by the gross, well adapted for matrimony, without any apparent faults, and with no particularly striking qualities. People say of her, Mademoiselle Le Jol is a very nice girl. And tomorrow they will say, What a very nice woman Madame Raymond is. She belongs, in a word, to that immense number of girls whom one is glad to have for one's wife, till the moment comes when one discovers that one happens to prefer all other women to that particular woman whom one has married. Well, you will say to me, what on earth did you get married for? I hardly like to tell you the strange and seemingly improbable reason that urged me on to this senseless act. The fact, however, is that I am afraid of being alone. I don't know how to tell you or to make you understand me, but my state of mind is so wretched that you will pity me and despise me. I do not want to be alone any longer at night. I want to feel that there is someone close to me, touching me, a being who can speak and say something, no matter what it be. I wish to be able to awaken somebody by my side, so that I may be able to ask some sudden question, a stupid question even, if I feel inclined, so that I may hear a human voice, and feel that there is some waking soul close to me, someone whose reason is at work, so that when I hastily light the candle I may see some human face by my side, because, because, I am ashamed to confess it, because I am afraid of being alone. Oh, you don't understand me yet. I am not afraid of any danger. If a man were to come into the room, I should kill him without trembling. I am not afraid of ghosts, nor do I believe in the supernatural. I am not afraid of dead people, for I believe in the total annihilation of every being that disappears from the face of this earth. Well, yes, well, it must be told. I am afraid of myself, afraid of that horrible sensation of incomprehensible fear. You may laugh, if you like. It is terrible, and I cannot get over it. I am afraid of the walls, of the furniture, of the familiar objects which are animated as far as I am concerned by a kind of animal life. Above all, I am afraid of my own dreadful thoughts, of my reason, which seems as if it were about to leave me, driven away by a mysterious and invisible agony. At first I feel a vague uneasiness in my mind, which— causes a cold shiver to run all over me. I look round, and of course nothing is to be seen, and I wish that there was something there, no matter what, as long as it was something tangible. I am frightened merely because I cannot understand my own terror. If I speak, I am afraid of my own voice. If I walk, I am afraid of I know not what, behind the door, behind the curtains, in the cupboard, or under my bed, and— Yet all the time I know there is nothing anywhere, 
and I turn round suddenly because I am afraid of what is behind me, although there is nothing there, and I know it. I become agitated. I feel that my fear increases, and so I shut myself up in my own room, get into bed, and hide under the clothes, and there, cowering down, rolled into a ball, I close my eyes in despair, and remain thus for an indefinite time, remembering that my candle is alight on the table by my bedside, and that I ought to put it out, and yet I dare not do it. It is very terrible, is it not, to, to be like that? Formerly I felt nothing of all that. I came home quite calm, and went up and down my apartment without anything disturbing my peace of mind. Had any one told me that I should be attacked by a malady, for I can call it nothing else, of most improbable fear, such a stupid and terrible malady as it is, I should have laughed outright. I was certainly never afraid of opening the door in the dark. I went to bed slowly, without locking it, and never got up in the middle of the night to make sure that everything was firmly closed. It began last year, in a very strange manner, on a damp autumn evening. When my servant had left the room, after I had dined, I asked myself what I was going to do. I walked up and down my room for some time, feeling tired without any reason for it, unable to work, and even without energy to read. A fine rain was falling, and I felt unhappy, a prey to one of those fits of despondency, without any apparent cause, which make us feel inclined to cry or to talk, no matter to whom, so as to shake off our depressing thoughts. I felt that I was alone, and my rooms seemed to me to be more empty than they had ever been before. I was in the midst of infinite and overwhelming solitude. What was I to do? I sat down, but a kind of nervous impatience seemed to affect my legs, so I got up and began to walk about again. I was perhaps rather feverish, for my hands, which I had clasped behind me as one often does when walking slowly, almost seemed to burn one another. Then, suddenly, a cold shiver ran down my back, and I thought the damp air might have penetrated into my room, so I lit the fire for the first time that year, and sat down again and looked at the flames. But soon I felt that I could not possibly remain quiet, and so I got up again, and determined to go out, to pull myself together, and to find a friend to bear me company. I could not find any one, so I walked to the boulevard to try and meet some acquaintance or other there. It was wretched everywhere, and the wet pavement glistened in the gaslight, while the oppressive warmth of the almost impalpable rain lay heavily over the streets, and seemed to obscure the light of the lamps. I went on slowly saying to myself, I shall not find a soul to talk to. I glanced into several cafés, from the Madeleine as far as the Faubourg Poissonnier, and saw many unhappy-looking individuals sitting at the tables who did not seem to have enough energy left to finish the refreshments they had ordered. For a long time I wandered aimlessly up and down, and about midnight I started for home. I was very calm and very tired, my janitor opened the door at once, which was quite unusual for him, and I thought that another lodger had probably just come in. When I go out, I always double-lock the door of my room, and I found it merely closed, which surprised me, but I supposed that some letters had been brought up for me in the course of the evening. I went in, and found my fire still burning so that it lighted up the room a little, and, while in the act of taking up a candle— I noticed somebody sitting in the armchair by my fire, warming his feet, with his back toward me. I was not in the slightest degree frightened. I thought, very naturally, that some friend or other had come to see me. No doubt the porter, to whom I had said I was going out, had lent him his own key. In a moment I remembered all the circumstances of my return, how the street door had been opened immediately, and that my own door was only latched and not locked. I could see nothing of my friend but his head, and he had evidently gone to sleep while waiting for me, so I went up to him to rouse him. I saw him quite distinctly. His right arm was hanging down, and his legs were crossed. The position of his head, which was somewhat inclined to the left of the armchair, 
seemed to indicate that he was asleep. Who can it be? I asked myself. I could not see clearly, as the room was rather dark, so I put out my hand to touch him on the shoulder, and it came in contact with the back of the chair. There was nobody there. The seat was empty. I fairly jumped with fright. For a moment I drew back, as if confronted by some terrible danger. Then I turned round again, impelled by an imperious standing upright, panting with fear, so upset that I could not collect my thoughts, and ready to faint. But I am a cool man, and soon recovered myself. I thought, it is a mere hallucination, that is all, and I immediately began to reflect on this phenomenon. Thoughts fly quickly, at such moments. I had been suffering from an hallucination that was an incontestable fact. My mind had been perfectly lucid, and had acted regularly and logically, so there was nothing the matter with the brain. It was only my eyes that had been deceived. They had had a vision, one of those visions which lead simple folk to believe in miracles. It was a nervous seizure of the optical apparatus, nothing more. The eyes were rather congested, perhaps. I lit my candle, and when I stooped down to the fire in doing so, I noticed that I was trembling, and I raised myself up with a jump, as if somebody had touched me from behind. I was certainly not by any means calm. I walked up and down a little, and hummed a tune or two. Then I double-locked the door, and felt rather reassured. Now, at any rate, nobody could come in. I sat down again, and thought over my adventure for a long time. Then I went to bed, and blew out the light. For some minutes all went well. I lay quietly on my back. But presently an irresistible desire seized me to look round the room, and I turned over on my side. My fire was nearly out, and the few glowing embers threw a faint light on the floor by the chair, where I fancied I saw the man sitting again. I quickly struck a match, but I had been mistaken. There was nothing there. I got up, however, and hid the chair behind my bed, and tried to get to sleep, as the room was now dark. But I had not forgotten myself for more than five minutes, when in my dream I saw all the scene which I had previously witnessed as clearly as if it were reality. I woke up with a start, and, having lit the candle, sat up in bed, without venturing even to try to go to sleep again. Twice, however, sleep overcame me for a few moments in spite of myself, and twice I saw the same thing again, till I fancied I was going mad. When day broke, however, I thought that I was cured, and slept peacefully till noon. Ah, it was all past and over. I had been feverish, had had the nightmare, I, I know not what. I had been ill, in fact, but yet thought I was a great fool. I enjoyed myself thoroughly that evening. I dined at a restaurant, and afterward went to the theatre, and then started for home. But as I got near the house, I was once more seized by a strange feeling of uneasiness. I was afraid of seeing him again. I was not afraid of him, not afraid of his presence, in which I did not believe, but I was afraid of being deceived again. I was afraid of some fresh hallucination, afraid lest fear should take possession of me. For more than an hour I wandered up and down the pavement. Then, feeling that I was really too foolish, I returned home. I breathed so hard that I could hardly get upstairs and remained standing outside my door for more than ten minutes, and suddenly I had a courageous impulse, and my will asserted itself. I inserted my key into the lock, and went into the apartment with a candle in my hand. I kicked open the bedroom door, which was partly open, and cast a frightened glance toward the fireplace. There was nothing there. Ah, oh, what a relief, and— what a delight! What a deliverance! <laughs> oh, I walked up and down briskly and boldly, but I was not altogether reassured, and kept turning round with a jump. The very shadows in the corners disquieted me. I slept badly, and was constantly disturbed by imaginary noises, but did not see him. No, that was all over. Since that time I have been afraid of being alone at night. 
I feel that the spectre is there, close to me, around me, but it has not appeared to me again. And supposing it did, what would it matter, since I do not believe in it, and know that it is nothing? However, it still worries me, because I am constantly thinking of it. His right arm hanging down, and his head inclined to the left, like a man who was a sleeper. Oh, oh, I don't want to think about it. Why, however, am I so persistently possessed with this idea? His, his feet were close to the fire. He haunts me. It is very stupid. But who and what is he? I know that he does not exist except in my cowardly imagination, in my fears, and in my agony. There, enough of that. Yes. It is all very well for me to reason with myself, to stiffen my backbone, so to say, but I cannot remain at home, because I know he is there. I know I shall not see him again, he, he will not show himself again. That is all over. But he is there all the same, and my thoughts. He remains invisible, but that does not prevent his being there. He is behind the doors, in the closed cupboard, in the wardrobe, under the bed, in every dark corner. If I open the door or the cupboard, if I take the candle to look under the bed and throw a light on the dark places, he is there no longer, but I feel that he is behind me. I turn round, certain that I shall not see him, that I shall never see him again, but for all that he is behind me. It is very stupid, it is dreadful, but what am I to do? I cannot help it. But if there were two of us in the place, I feel certain that he would not be there any longer for he is there just because I am alone, simply and solely, because I am alone. THE DEVIL The peasant and the doctor stood on opposite sides of the bed beside the old, dying woman. She was calm and resigned, and her mind quite clear as she looked at them and listened to their conversation. She was going to die— and she did not rebel at it, for her time was come, as she was ninety-two. The July sun streamed in at the window and the open door, and cast its hot flames on the uneven brown clay floor, which had been stamped down by four generations of clodhoppers. The smell of the fields came in also, driven by the sharp wind and parched by the noontide heat. The grasshoppers chirped themselves hoarse, and filled the country with their shrill noise which was like that of the wooden toys which are sold to children at fair time. The doctor raised his voice, and said, Honore, you cannot leave your mother in this state. She may die at any moment. And the peasant, in great distress, replied, But I must get in my wheat, for it has been lying on the ground a long time, and the weather is just right for it. What do you say about it, mother? And the dying old woman, still tormented by her Norman avariciousness, replied yes with her eyes and her forehead, and thus urged her son to get in his wheat and to leave her to die alone. But the doctor got angry, and stamping his foot, he said, You are no better than a brute, do you hear? And I will not allow you to do it, do you understand? And if you must get in your wheat today, go and fetch Rappe's wife and make her look after your mother. I will have it, do you understand me? And if you do not obey me, I will let you die like a dog, when you're ill in your turn, do you hear?" The peasant, a tall, thin fellow with slow movements, who was tormented by indecision, by his fear of the doctor and his fierce love of saving, hesitated, calculated, and stammered out, "'How much does La Rope charge for attending sick people?' "'How should I know? That depends on how long she is needed. Settle it with her by heaven.' but I want her to be here within an hour, do you hear? So the man decided. I will go for her, he replied. Don't get angry, doctor. And the latter left, calling out as he went, Be careful, be very careful, you know, but I do not joke when I am angry. As soon as they were alone, the peasant turned to his mother and said in a resigned voice, I will go and fetch Lara Pay, as the man will have it. Don't worry till I get back. And he went out in his turn. La Rappe, who was an old washerwoman, watched the dead and the dying of the neighbourhood, and then, as soon as she had sewn her customers into that linen cloth from which they would emerge no more, she went and took up her iron to smooth out the linen of the living. Wrinkled like a last year's apple, spiteful, envious, avaricious, with a phenomenal avarice, 
bent double, as if she had been broken in half across the loins by the constant motion of passing the iron over the linen. One might have said that she had a kind of abnormal and cynical love of a death struggle. She never spoke of anything but of the people she had seen die, of the various kinds of deaths at which she had been present, and she related with the greatest minuteness details which were always similar, just as a sportsman recounts his luck. When Honoré Bonton entered her cottage, he found her preparing the starch for the collars of the women villagers, and he said, "'Good evening. I hope you are pretty well, Mother Rappé.' She turned her head round to look at him, and said, "'As usual, as usual. And you?' "'Oh, as for me, I as well as I could wish, but my mother is not well.' "'Your mother?' "'Yes, my mother. What is the matter with her?' She's going to turn up her toes, that's what's the matter with her. The old woman took her hands out of the water and asked with sudden sympathy, Is she as bad as all that? The doctor says she will not last till morning. Then she certainly is very bad. Honoré hesitated, for he wanted to make a few preparatory remarks before coming to his proposition, but as he could hit upon nothing, he made up his mind suddenly. How much will you ask to stay with her till the end? You know that I am not rich, and I cannot even afford to keep a servant girl. It is just that which has brought my poor mother to this state. Too much worry and fatigue. She does the work of ten in spite of her ninety-two years. You don't find any made of that stuff nowadays. La Rappé answered gravely, There are two prices, forty sous by day and three francs by night for the rich, and twenty sous by day and forty by night for the others. You shall pay me the twenty and forty. But the peasant reflected, for he knew his mother well. He knew how tenacious of life, how vigorous and unyielding she was, and she might last another week, in spite of the doctor's opinion. And so he said resolutely, "'No, I would rather you would fix a price for the whole time until the end. I will take my chance, one way or the other. The doctor says she will die very soon. If that happens, so much the better for you, and so much the worse for her.' But if she holds out till tomorrow or longer, so much the better for her, and so much the worse for you. The nurse looked at the man in astonishment, for she had never treated a death as a speculation, and she hesitated, tempted by the idea of the possible gain. But she suspected that he wanted to play her a trick. I can say nothing until I have seen your mother, she replied. Then come with me and see her. She washed her hands and went with him immediately. They did not speak on the road. She walked with short, hasty steps, while he strode on with his long legs, as if he were crossing a brook at every step. The cows lying down in the fields, overcome by the heat, raised their heads heavily and lowed feebly at the two passers-by, as if to ask them for some green grass. When they got near the house, Honoré Bonton murmured, "'Suppose it is all over?' and his unconscious wish that it might be so showed itself in the sound of his voice. But the old woman was not dead. She was lying on her back, on her wretched bed, her hands covered with a purple cotton counterpane, horribly thin, knotty hands like the claws of strange animals, like crabs half-closed by rheumatism, fatigue, and the work of nearly a century which she had accomplished. Larapé went up to the bed and looked at the dying woman, felt her pulse, tapped her on the chest, listened to her breathing, and asked her questions so as to hear her speak. And then, having looked at her for some time, she went out of the room, followed by Honoré. Her decided opinion was that the old woman would not last till night. He asked, Well? And the sick nurse replied, Well, she may last two days, perhaps three. You will have to give me six francs, everything included. Six francs, six francs, he shouted. Are you out of your mind? I tell you she cannot last more than five or six hours. And they disputed angrily for some time. But as the nurse said she must go home, as the time was going by, and as his wheat would not come to the farmyard of its own accord, he finally agreed to her terms. Very well, then, that is settled. Six francs, including everything, until the corpse is taken out. And he went away with long strides to his wheat, which was lying on the ground under the hot sun which ripens the grain, 
while the sick nurse went in again to the house. She had brought some work with her, for she worked without ceasing by the side of the dead and dying, sometimes for herself, sometimes for the family which employed her as seamstress, and paid her rather more in that capacity. Suddenly she asked, "'Have you received the last sacraments, Mother Bonton?' The old peasant woman shook her head, and Larape, who was very devout, got up quickly. "'Good heavens, is it possible? I will go and fetch the cure.' And she rushed off to the parsonage so quickly that the urchins in the street thought some accident had happened when they saw her running. The priest came immediately in his surplice, preceded by a choir-boy who rang a bell to announce the passage of the host through the parched and quiet country. Some men who were working at a distance took off their large hats and remained motionless until the white vestment had disappeared behind some farm buildings. The women who were making up the sheaves stood up and made the sign of the cross. The frightened black hens ran away along the ditch until they reached a well-known hole, through which they suddenly disappeared, while a foal which was tied in a meadow took fright at the sight of the surplus, and began to gallop round and round, kicking cut every now and then. The acolyte in his red cassock walked quickly, and the priest, with his head inclined toward one shoulder and his square beretta on his head, followed him, muttering some prayers. While last of all came La Rape, bent almost double as if she wished to prostrate herself, as she walked with folded hands as they do in church. Honari saw them pass in the distance, and he asked, Where is our priest going? His man, who was more intelligent, replied, He is taking the sacrament to your mother, of course. The peasant was not surprised, and said, That may be, and went on with his work. Mother Bonton confessed, received absolution and communion, and the priest took his departure, leaving the two women alone in the suffocating room, while La Rape began to look at the dying woman, and to ask herself whether it could last much longer. The day was on the wane, and gusts of cooler air began to blow, causing a view of Ypenon, which was fastened to the wall by two pins, to flap up and down. The scanty window curtains, which had formerly been white, but were now yellow and covered with fly-specks, looked as if they were going to fly off, as if they were struggling to get away, like the old woman's soul. Lying motionless, with her eyes open, she seemed to await with indifference that death which was so near, and which yet delayed its coming. Her short breathing whistled in her constricted throat. It would stop altogether soon, and there would be one woman less in the world. No one would regret her. At nightfall, Honoré returned, and when he went up to the bed and saw that his mother was still alive, he asked, How is she? Just as he had done formerly when she had been ailing. And then he sent La Rape away, saying to her, Tomorrow morning at five o'clock, without fail. And she replied, Tomorrow at five o'clock. She came at daybreak, and found Honoré eating his soup, which he had made himself before going to work, and the sick nurse asked him, "'Well, is your mother dead?' "'She is rather better, on the contrary,' he replied, with a sly look out of the corner of his eyes, and he went out. La Rape, seized with anxiety, went up to the dying woman, who remained in the same state, lethargic and impassive, with her eyes open and her hands clutching the counterpane. The nurse perceived that this might go on thus for two days, four days, eight days— and her avaricious mind was seized with fear, while she was furious at the sly fellow who had tricked her, and at the woman who would not die. Nevertheless, she began to work, and waited, looking intently at the wrinkled face of Mother Bonton. When Honoré returned to breakfast, he seemed quite satisfied, and even in a bantering humour. He was decidedly getting in his wheat under very favourable circumstances. La Rape was becoming exasperated. Every minute now seemed to her so much time and money stolen from her. She felt a mad inclination to take this old woman, this headstrong old fool, this obstinate old wretch, and to stop that short rapid breath which was robbing her of her time and money by squeezing her throat a little. But then she reflected on the danger of doing so, and other thoughts came into her head. So she went up to the bed and said— have you ever seen the devil? Mother Bonton murmured, No. Then the sick nurse began to talk, 
and to tell her tales which were likely to terrify the weak mind of the dying woman. Some minutes before one dies, the devil appears, she said, to all who are in the death throes. He has a broom in his hand, a saucepan on his head, and he utters loud cries. When anybody sees him, all is over, and that person has only a few moments longer to live. She then enumerated all those to whom the devil had appeared that year. Mother Bonton, who had at last become disturbed in mind, moved about, wrung her hands, and tried to turn her head to look toward the end of the room. Suddenly, La Rapé disappeared at the foot of the bed. She took a sheet out of the cupboard and wrapped herself up in it. She put the iron saucepan on her head, so that its three short bent feet rose up like horns, and she took a broom in her right hand and a tin pail in her left, which she threw up suddenly, so that it might fall to the ground noisily. When it came down, it certainly made a terrible noise. Then, climbing upon a chair, the nurse lifted up the curtain which hung at the bottom of the bed, and showed herself, gesticulating and uttering shrill cries into the iron saucepan, which covered her face, while she menaced the old peasant woman, who was nearly dead, with her broom. Terrified, with an insane expression on her face, the dying woman made a superhuman effort to get up and escape. She even got her shoulders and chest out of bed, and then she fell back with a deep sigh. All was over, and La Rapé calmly put everything back into its place. The broom into the corner by the cupboard, the sheet inside it, the saucepan on the hearth, the pail on the floor, and the chair against the wall. Then, with professional movements, she closed the dead woman's large eyes, put a plate on the bed, and poured some holy water into it, placing in it the twig of boxwood, which had been nailed to the chest of drawers. And kneeling down, she fervently repeated the prayers for the dead, which she knew by heart, as a matter of business. And when Honoré returned in the evening, he found her praying, and he calculated immediately that she had made twenty sows out of him, for she had only spent three days and one night there, which made five francs altogether, instead of the six which he owed her. THE HAND All were crowding around Monsieur Bermoutier, the judge, who was giving his opinion about the Song Cloud mystery. For a month, this inexplicable crime had been the talk of Paris. Nobody could make head or tail of it. Monsieur Bermoutier, standing with his back to the fireplace, was talking, citing the evidence, discussing the various theories, but arriving at no conclusion. Some women had risen, in order to get nearer to him, and were standing with their eyes fastened on the clean-shaven face of the judge, who was saying such weighty things. They were shaking and trembling, moved by fear and curiosity, and by the eager and insatiable desire for the horrible, which haunts the soul of every woman. One of them, paler than the others, said during a pause, "'It's terrible! It verges on the supernatural! The truth will never be known!' The judge turned to her. "'True, madame. It is likely that the actual facts will never be discovered. As for the word supernatural, which you have just used, it has nothing to do with the matter. We are in the presence of a very cleverly conceived and executed crime, so well enshrouded in mystery that we cannot disentangle it from the involved circumstances which surround it. But once I had to take charge of an affair in which the uncanny seemed to play a part. In fact, the case became so confused that it had to be given up. Several women exclaimed at once, "'Oh, tell us about it!' Monsieur Bermoutier smiled in a dignified manner, as a judge should, and went on. "'Do not think, however, that I, for one minute, ascribed anything in the case to supernatural influences. I believe only in normal causes. But if, instead of using the word supernatural to express what we do not understand, we were simply to make use of the word inexplicable, it would be much better. At any rate, in the affair of which I am about to tell you, it is especially the surrounding preliminary circumstances which impressed me. Here are the facts. I was, at that time, a judge at Ajaxio, a little white city on the edge of a bay, which is surrounded by high mountains. The majority of the cases which came up before me concerned vendettas. There are some that are superb, dramatic, ferocious, heroic. 
We find there the most beautiful causes for revenge of which one could dream. Enmities hundreds of years old, quieted for a time, but never extinguished. Abominable stratagems, murders becoming massacres, and almost deeds of glory. For two years I heard of nothing but the price of blood, of this terrible Corsican prejudice which compels revenge for insults, meted out to the offending person and all his descendants and relatives. I had seen old men, children, cousins murdered. My head was full of these stories. One day I learned that an Englishman had just hired a little villa at the end of the bay for several years. He had brought with him a French servant, whom he had engaged on the way at Marseilles. Soon this peculiar person, living alone, only going out to hunt and fish, aroused a widespread interest. He never spoke to anyone, never went to the town, and every morning he would practice for an hour or so with his revolver and rifle. Legends were built up around him. It was said that he was some high personage, fleeing from his fatherland for political reasons. Then it was affirmed that he was in hiding after having committed some abominable crime. Some particularly horrible circumstances were even mentioned. In my judicial position, I thought it necessary to get some information about this man, but it was impossible to learn anything. He called himself Sir John Rowell. I therefore had to be satisfied with watching him as closely as I could, but I could see nothing suspicious about his actions. However, as rumours about him were growing and becoming more widespread, I decided to try to see the stranger myself, and I began to hunt regularly in the neighbourhood of his grounds. For a long time I watched without finding an opportunity. At last it came to me, in the shape of a partridge which I shot and killed right in front of the Englishman. My dog fetched it for me, but, taking the bird, I went at once to Sir John Rowell, and, begging his pardon, asked him to accept it. He was a big man, with red hair and beard, very tall, very broad, a kind of calm and polite Hercules. He had nothing of the so-called British stiffness, and in a broad English accent he thanked me warmly for my attention. At the end of a month we had had five or six conversations. One night, at last, as I was passing before his door, I saw him in the garden, seated astride a chair, smoking his pipe. I bowed, and he invited me to come in and have a glass of beer. I needed no urging. He received me with the most punctilious English courtesy, sang the praises of France and of Corsica, and declared that he was quite in love with this country. Then, with great caution, and under the guise of a vivid interest, I asked him a few questions about his life and his plans. He answered without embarrassment, telling me that he had travelled a great deal in Africa, in the Indies, in America. He added, laughing, I have had many adventures. Then I turned the conversation on hunting, and he gave me the most curious details on hunting the hippopotamus, the tiger, the elephant, and even the gorilla. I said, Are all these animals dangerous? He smiled, Oh, no, man is the worst. And he laughed a good broad laugh, the wholesome laugh of a contented Englishman. I have also frequently been man-hunting. Then he began to talk about weapons, and he invited me to come in and see different makes of guns. His parlour was draped in black, black silk, embroidered in gold. Big yellow flowers as brilliant as fire were worked on the dark material. He said, It is a Japanese material. But in the middle of the widest panel, a strange thing attracted my attention. A black object stood out against a square of red velvet. I went up to it. It was a hand a human hand, not the clean white hand of a skeleton, but a dried black hand with yellow nails, the muscles exposed, and traces of old blood on the bones, which were cut off as clean as though it had been chopped off with an axe, near the middle of the forearm. Around the wrist, an enormous iron chain, riveted and soldered to this unclean member, fastened it to the wall by a ring, strong enough to hold an elephant in leash. I asked, "'What is that?' The Englishman answered quietly, "'That is my best enemy. It comes from America, too. The bones were severed by a sword, and the skin cut off with a sharp stone, and dried in the sun for a week. I touched these human remains, which must have belonged to a giant. The uncommonly long fingers were attached by enormous tendons, which still had pieces of skin hanging to them in places. This hand was terrible to see. It made one think of some savage vengeance.' I said, This man must have been very strong. 
The Englishman answered quietly, Yes, but I was stronger than he. I put on this chain to hold him. I thought that he was joking. I said, This chain is useless now. The hand won't run away. Sir John Rowell answered seriously, It always wants to go away. This chain is needed. I glanced at him quickly, questioning his face, and I asked myself, Is he an insane man, or a practical joker? But his face remained inscrutable, calm, and friendly. I turned to other subjects, and admired his rifles. However, I noticed that he kept three loaded revolvers in the room, as though constantly in fear of some attack. I paid him several calls. Then I did not go any more. People had become used to his presence. Everybody had lost interest in him. A whole year rolled by. One morning, toward the end of November, my servant awoke me and announced that Sir John Rowell had been murdered during the night. Half an hour later, I entered the Englishman's house, together with the police commissioner and the captain of the gendarme. The servant, bewildered and in despair, was crying before the door. At first I suspected this man, but he was innocent. The guilty party could never be found. On entering Sir John's parlour, I noticed the body stretched out on its back in the middle of the room. His vest was torn. The sleeve of his jacket had been pulled off. Everything pointed to a violent struggle. The Englishman had been strangled. His face was black, swollen, and frightful, and seemed to express a terrible fear. He held something between his teeth, and his neck, pierced by five or six holes which looked as though they had been made by some iron instrument, was covered with blood. A physician joined us. He examined the finger marks on the neck for a long time, and then made this strange announcement. It looks as though he had been strangled by a skeleton. A cold chill seemed to run down my back, and I looked over to where I had formerly seen the terrible hand. It was no longer there. The chain was hanging down, broken. I bent over the dead man, and, in his contracted mouth, I found one of the fingers of this vanished hand, cut, or rather sawed off by the teeth down to the second knuckle. Then the investigation began. Nothing could be discovered. No door, window, or piece of furniture had been forced. The two watchdogs had not been aroused from their sleep. Here, in a few words, is the testimony of the servant. For a month his master had seemed excited. He had received many letters, which he would immediately burn. Often, in a fit of passion which approached madness, he had taken a switch and struck wildly at this dried hand riveted to the wall, and which had disappeared, no one knows how, at the very hour of the crime. He would go to bed very late, and carefully lock himself in. He always kept weapons within reach. Often at night he would talk loudly, as though he were quarrelling with someone. That night, somehow, he had made no noise, and it was only on going to open the windows that the servant had found Sir John murdered. He suspected no one. I communicated what I knew of the dead man to the judges and public officials. Throughout the whole island a minute investigation was carried on. Nothing could be found out. One night, about three months after the crime, I had a terrible nightmare. I seemed to see the horrible hand running over my curtains and walls like an immense scorpion or spider. Three times I awoke, three times I went to sleep again. Three times I saw the hideous object galloping round my room and moving its fingers like legs. The following day, the hand was brought me, found in the cemetery, on the grave of Sir John Rowell, who had been buried there because we had been unable to find his family. The first finger was missing. Ladies, there is my story. I know nothing more. The women, deeply stirred, were pale and trembling. One of them exclaimed, but that is neither a climax nor an explanation. We will be unable to sleep unless you give us your opinion of what had occurred. The judge smiled severely. Oh, ladies, I shall certainly spoil your terrible dreams. I simply believe that the legitimate owner of the hand was not dead, that he came to get it with his remaining one. But I don't know how. It was a kind of vendetta. One of the women murmured, No, it can't be that. And the judge, still smiling, said, didn't I tell you that my explanation would not satisfy you? If you enjoyed listening today, 
Be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.